General Dallaire, 30 years have passed since those uh, defining events in your life in Rwanda. When you think back to the war in Rwanda, to your time being the commander of UNAMIR uh, mission, what goes through your head these days when you think back to those days? What goes through is rage. Uh, 30 years may seem a long time for some, but and not when you live and experience uh, that my colleagues and I lived in the Rwanda and particularly the Rwandans. But worse than that is that after 30 years of apparent peace, which was really only truces of, of uh, trying to find new instruments to prevent the mass atrocities and all kinds of declarations and processes and doctrines like responsibility to protect and so on, uh, we discover that uh, in places like uh, Myanmar, like uh, the uh, Ukraine, like Gaza, uh, the world is not in any way, shape, or form any more effective in preventing, let alone stopping, mass atrocities and abuse of human rights uh, to innocent people. So you still feel that rage, and maybe more so these days, because you feel like we've learned nothing. I think that I, I feel rage, but I think the international community and the political elites of the world, although we can only speak of political elites because we can't speak of statesmen because there's none anymore, uh, that the political elites are to be held even more accountable uh, now than they were in 1993, 94, when we had much less capabilities, much, not prepared for any of this kind of uh, of imploding nations and failing states and so on. Uh, and uh, with all that we've done, we still see self-interest dominating, a lack of will and courage on the part of not only leading powers, but leading middle powers, even like Canada, for intervening and to uh, intervening not by simply throwing ammunition and 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 such to people who are being slaughtered or killing and so on, but to actually intervene to protect and to engage the principles that we've been working on for the last 30 years of trying to protect innocent civilians. I want to talk to you about Canada in particular. When you're talking about throwing ammunition at someone, I'm assuming you're talking about uh, ammunition shipments to Ukraine and armaments. Uh, in many other, there's, of course, a major uh, regional conflict that threatens to become a, a, a much bigger conflict happening in the Middle East. Uh, there is a, a civil war, really, in, in Haiti right now. Do you feel you have been such a vocal critic uh, for what Canada's role should be in the world as a peacekeeper, as well as other uh, major Western powers? Do you feel Canada is doing what should be its role when it comes to the wars abroad right now? Canada is not Canada outside of its borders. Canada, when I go around the world, I am tired of hearing in French, grand parleur petit faisant, which means very specifically in English, uh, a big talker, but a, little, a small doer. Instead of being the leading middle power with extraordinary diplomatic and intellectual engagement with innovative ideas and the courage to implement them that we've seen in the history of Canada since the Pearson era, th era through the 60s into the 70s, we have become somebody else's sort of reinforcement. We have become somebody else's uh, uh, partner. We have lost that extraordinary position of where countries look to us, depend on us for bringing innovative solutions and actually engaging in trying to prevent things from happening, let alone uh, being there when things go catastrophic and be even prepared to pay the price sometimes in blood to ensure that we're protecting innocent civilians from massive abuses. Who do you blame for that, General Dallaire? Is it the current government, the last few governments, uh, Canadian military, lack of investment in our military, or kind of changing attitudes among Canadians themselves. Who do you think is primarily responsible for this? There is, it's, it's not a Canadian phenomenon. It is, in fact, uh, particularly a, a northern uh, country's uh, uh, perspective of what the security and what 
peace is. And so you've got the big players who during the post-Cold War uh, truce era, who rearmed like the Americans, the Chinese, the, uh, the Russians, and then you get the Europeans who disarmed uh, and tried to move towards uh, a, a more um, uh, sort of human security agenda, only to find uh, that it, there are still uh, hot spots that need, yeah, at times, the demonstration of power and the use of power. Where we seem to be uh, in this sort of rut is, is that we were not able to go beyond the talk of it, beyond the support from afar. Example, when the Russians came across the border in eastern uh, Ukraine a couple of years ago, NATO should have crossed the western border and stood firm. And yeah, called the bluff of tactical nukes from, from the Russians. We didn't do that. We just pour more ammunition and let the Ukrainians get themselves wiped out, knowing full well that ultimately they will be worn down and attributed to a position that they're going to have to come to some horrible compromise. And we'll live with that, and we'll and we'll we'll think that oh well, we that crisis is now solved. Where do we go from there? But we didn't find peace, and in in the Middle East, we're not talking about peace. Oh, we're talking about the two state and so on. What we're talking about is pure use of power, and creating generational wars uh, in areas that you'd think uh, they've learned so many lessons that they in fact would want to avoid it.